Wands up for Maggie Smith. Sadly, the beloved Professor McGonagall passed away at the age of 89 on September 27th. It's hard to believe that the woman who brought so much magic to our lives is no longer with us. But it was great, you know. Tributes have been flooding in, especially from Maggie's Harry Potter co-stars. I mean, who could forget Dame Maggie as Professor McGonagall, right? That sharp wit, iconic pointed hat. She definitely made her mark on all of us. It did sort of change your life in a way. Well, yes, a lot of very small people kind of <laughs> used to say hello to me, and, and that, that was nice. Daniel Radcliffe had some sweet things to say about her. He called her fiercely intelligent, with a gloriously sharp tongue. Sounds exactly like McGonagall, doesn't it? He also admitted that while she could be a bit intimidating, she was hilarious, and working with her was an unforgettable experience. Quite the legend, huh? I met her when I was nine for the first time, and I didn't know like who she was. My, my parents were like, oh my god, you're working with Maggie Smith, that's huge. But I was not like a prime of Miss Jean Brody fan. And Emma Watson, who we all know as Hermione, shared how she didn't realize at the time that she was working with the true definition of greatness. Isn't that something we can all relate to? You never fully appreciate those moments until later. Rupert Grint, the one and only Ron Weasley, had such a sweet memory. He talked about how lucky he was to share a dance with Maggie on set. Can you imagine? That's a moment you'd hold on to forever. That was bloody brilliant. Oh, thank you for that assessment, Mr. Weasley. Miriam Margolias, who played Professor Sprout, described Maggie as the best of the best. She said Maggie was a mix of ferocity, mischief, delight, and tenderness. Not that I'm rubbishing Maggie Smith because she's a great lady. I'm <laughs> Scared of her, actually. <laughs> and yeah, while Maggie could be a bit terrifying, we can picture that, right? Miriam also highlighted her kindness. Even the royal family joined in with their tributes. King Charles and Queen Camilla said, As the curtain comes down on a national treasure, we join the world in remembering her many great performances and her warmth and wit. Now, when you've got the royals paying tribute, you know you've made a mark. Do you accept the fact that you're a star? If you say so. Her Downton Abbey co-stars had nothing but admiration, too. Hugh Bonneville called her sharp-eyed, sharp-witted, and full of talent. Well, Maggie Smith is a phenomenon, let's face it. While Michelle Dockery said she felt incredibly lucky to have known such a maverick. Sometimes I still pinch myself that I get to work with Maggie and have worked with her for so many years now. It's a real privilege because she is one of the greats. And let's not forget Julian Fellows, the creator of Downton, who called Maggie a joy to write for, intelligent, funny, and heartbreaking. And she was very, always very kind, very professional, very funny, uh, both in her acting and off the screen. Even Sir Paul McCartney shared a story about meeting Maggie back in the 60s. He described her as irreverent and fun-loving with a wicked sense of humor. You're kidding. Kristen Scott Thomas, who worked with Maggie in Gosford Park, said she always made her laugh, but warned that Maggie didn't suffer fools gladly. She's survived by her two sons, Toby Stevens and Chris Larkin. They shared the heartbreaking news of her passing, saying she passed away peacefully in hospital, surrounded by friends and family. They also thanked the Chelsea and Westminster hospital staff for their kindness and care during her final days. It's hard to believe Maggie is no longer with us, but her legacy will live on in all the incredible roles she played and the lives she touched. And though she will forever be remembered for her sharp wit and grace as Professor McGonagall, Maggie's life beyond the screen was filled with moments of both immense love and deep loss. Maggie Smith met Beverly Cross on the steps of the Ash Molayan, the University of Oxford's Museum of Art and Archaeology, when she was 18. He was a bit older, lovely, and a playwright. In 1960, Smith was cast in the West End production of Cross's second play, Strip the Willow. The actor gave a career-launching performance, and the playwright fell deeply in love with his star. For her, it was love at first sight as well. Beverly proposed quickly, which proved more than slightly controversial as he was still married at the time. Beverly begged Maggie to wait out the lengthy divorce process. She agreed to wait. In a twist of events as dramatic as any play, while waiting for his divorce to go through, she met Robert Stevens. Which was entirely Bev's fault, because he made me go to the National Theater when I had already said no, Maggie said. She fell in love with and married the actor. And Cross, while working on the screenplay of Lawrence of Arabia, got married as well. Smith later said that her inbuilt safety mechanism didn't help her. 
She never saw Stevens as dangerous. Everyone else did. God knows Larry tried hard to persuade him not to go anywhere near me. So maybe it was me who was seen as the crazy one. Or maybe it was Lawrence Olivier identifying himself with Stevens. This was the same time that Olivier was extricating himself from his relationship with Vivian Lee. In 1967, when Smith and Stevens married, Lee tragically passed away. Before Maggie and Robert actually got married, they had to go through a few hoops. They made their plans, but Robert's divorce from his second wife was not yet finalized, and to complicate matters somewhat, Maggie was pregnant. Eventually, the divorce came through, and they married 10 days before the baby, now known as the actor Chris Larkin, was born, with no scandalous headlines ensuing. So, the story never got to be written. For the first few years, Smith said that she was unaware of his drinking. Everything seemed fine. In 1969, they made the prime of Miss Jean Brody together. Robert Stevens is the actor who was once talked of reverentially as Olivier's heir. This electrifying, charismatic star in one season played four major roles at the National Theater. His marriage to Maggie Smith became the stuff of legends. They became the first couple of British theater. Then something happened. Towards the end of the 70s, his career collapsed, and he disappeared in a mist of obscurity, alcoholism, and promiscuity. While playing the lead in Billy Wilder's The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, Stevens tried to commit suicide, and after that, it was just hopeless. We had two little boys. He didn't understand. I sure as hell didn't understand. It got worse, and then it went on getting worse and worse. In the end, it was destroying everybody, and he was having so many affairs. Well, my father was a great traveler. He traveled from one woman to another all through his life, which comes to much the same thing. <laughs> Apparently, Roberts was once forced to tell Smith about the affairs by his dentist friend. He said, if you don't, I will, so I had to tell her. Unfortunately, I'd had a slight romance with his receptionist, who was also his mistress. They tried for a while. Robert saw medics. When he was diagnosed as hypermanic, they asked what it meant, and the doctor said violent mood swings and indiscriminate sexual activity. And I thought, that about covers it, really, Maggie said. After six years, in 1973, she got out. I said, it can't go on, and he said, no, it can't. Honestly, I don't think I could have mattered less to him by then, but by then, nothing mattered to him. Saying that, Maggie laughed. Not because the memory is funny, but because that is what comedy sometimes is. The ability to pull back from a tragic situation and see it as if from the outside. Is it hard to be an actor married to another actor, your first Hideous. husband? Hideous. Don't ever do it. I'm not thinking of it, I. No, I'm not. Oh, good. When the Rocky Smith-Stevens marriage ended in divorce, Cross ended his second marriage. Maggie finally married the love of her life in 1975. They went to Ontario, Canada, where she worked for five years. She never heard from Stevens, and he never tried to contact his sons. Bev, that lovely man, brought them up, and they spent the next 23 years hand in hand. Tragically, Beverly passed away at 66 of heart disease. While they were together, she used to never talk about Stevens. Not while Bev was alive. It seemed somehow wiser, but I can talk safely now, now that there's nobody left to be hurt. Maggie also said that she never stopped loving Robert. I don't see how you can, really. I have two wonderful sons, and he is the reason for that. And towards the end of his life, they were all friends again. A lot of it was very, very merry and lovely. So I shall remember those bits. In 1993, Toby was playing Coriolanus at the Royal Shakespeare Company when Stevens was playing Falstaff and Lear. She rang him in his dressing room the night he was to open in King Lear. What did Maggie say to her former husband? What you always say when it's Lear, she replied. Good luck. No matter how turbulent the years of Maggie Smith's marriage to Robert Stevens were, they did result in something positive with the birth of their children, Chris Larkin, born Christopher Stevens, and Toby Stevens. Both of them have managed to establish their own acting careers. You can see Toby in the third and final season of sci-fi series Lost in Space on Netflix. When asked if she hoped to fall in love again, she was unequivocal. Absolutely not, she said. No way. Dame Maggie often says in interviews that Cross was the rock of her life. At the time of his death, she was appearing in a delicate balance at the Theatre Royal Haymarket. Showing great strength and perseverance, she continued in the role until the end of its run. 
Smith doesn't refrain from saying how lonely she is after losing the love of her life almost 25 years ago. She admits that she is struggling to live without Beverly. She often dreams about him. I don't know. It seems a bit pointless, going on one's own and not having someone to share it with. Jane Birkin's mother, Judy Campbell, once said an extraordinary thing to me when her husband died, that it was a strange feeling you were not number one with anybody. And when she found herself filming in Oxford, she went back to her old childhood haunts and to the steps of the Ashmolean where she met him all those years ago. That weird place that changes every three years and yet remains always the same. You know what's awful? What's awful is that it is all all right. She finds solace in her work and tries to stay busy. Maggie can act her way into and out of anything. Her range is phenomenal. Lady Macbeth or Desdemona opposite Laurence Olivier's Othello? No problem. The prime of Miss Jean Brody? An Oscar-winning performance. Later on, she became a scene stealer as Professor McGonagall in the Harry Potter series and the Dowager Countess of Grantham in Downton Abbey. The list goes on and on. In the process, the numerous awards she has received include two Oscars, five BAFTAs, three Emmys, three Golden Globes, and a Tony. Few, if any, other actors can match that. Maggie, you were truly one of a kind, and we'll miss you deeply.